watching Channel 14 Public Access Television for Olifield, Kentucky. Stay tuned for more programming. Coming up, a trip to Dollywood with Mayor Short and Brad Holbrook, a West Carter Junior High School student, tapes an interview with his grandmother. Next on Channel 14, the NBC TV program Cheers. Works with the post office. This tape was provided by Gail Smith of the Olifield Post Office. The program is on proper addressing of letters. Hey, guess what? You don't have to pay extra for more efficient mail service. All you have to do is know a few easy tricks to get the best out of postal technology. Cliffy's braving the elements to come over and tell us how. So take good notes. There'll be a pop quiz later. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. winter ice storms in Boston's history. State and local authorities are warning people to leave shelter only. Repeat, only in cases of absolute emergency. So please stay tuned for more about this devastating blizzard, which tonight holds the greater Boston area virtually paralyzed by ice and snow. Now back to our music, The Spoonful with Summer in the City. Yeah, I can't believe that less than two blocks away there's a whole health club full of sweaty bodybuilders and I gotta be snowed in here with this bunch of doofus. What's a doofus? It's plural for doofus, Woody, and you are the main doof. Why is she picking on me? She has no choice. See, Cliff isn't here and Rebecca's in her office. What about Sam? I would never pick on Sam. Besides, he isn't here. The fact of the matter is, we've entered out into this terrifying tempest tonight only because we're driven by the compelling need to perform one of the most basic, most vital, most crucially important missions in the entire spectrum of parental responsibility. You had to take the babysitter home? Nobody. We're applying for our son's enrollment in the college of our choice. Which, of course, is Harvard. Class of eight. Oh. Well, now, with only eight kids in the class, we get a lot more attention, I'm sure. Woody, listen to somebody who's been to school. They're talking about the class of 08. 2008, the year he graduates. Exactly, Rebecca. And it was to be postmarked by midnight tonight. Yeah, but 2008 until the next century, what's the big hurry? Because it's Harvard, Woody. It is not Benny's College of Bartending and Pretzel Management. <laughs> At any rate, we ducked in here to take shelter a moment's respite before pressing on to the post office in time to make the deadline. Ready, dear? Oh, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Yupsy Doodle, you can't go back out there. I thought you were supposed to be the smart ones. Didn't you hear what that guy on the radio said? Unless it's an official business or an absolute emergency, you can't go out. Who else but a real dipstick would be out on the streets on a night like this? Of them all. The rest of my case. Hey, Miss Hal, got your mail here. Sorry for the delay, but there's flaky precipitation is the bane of all mail carriers, as you know. What are you nuts, Flavin? Nobody's supposed to be out on the streets tonight. Oh, well, gotcha, Carver. This is official business. You know, your basic essential traffic. Eh? Right, Mary? Well, I've got every right to be out there fighting for my life and my footing. In fact, it's my job. I don't know if I ever told you folks, but uh, Either rain, or snow, or yeah. sleep. No, no, we were. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll flip, uh, 
uh, you mention it all the time, okay? And I, I really enjoy hearing it. Matter of fact, I enjoy hearing your voice all the time. Uh, you wouldn't by any chance be uh, dropping back by the post office uh, shortly, would you? Well, as a matter of fact, I would. This is practically my last stop. Blavin, I'm getting this totally strange, weird, unfamiliar feeling of respect for you. Jeez, I hope it's nothing permanent. Yeah, just go home, lay down, take a couple of aspirin. It usually works for Ma. Here you go, Clippy. Hey, what's up, Nat? My uh, 1985 income tax return. And my son's future. Uh, uh. My America's Funniest Home Video. It's 10 minutes of me and my friends hanging out trading bowling stores. Yeah, it's got to be postmarked by midnight tonight to be eligible for first prize. Uh. Forget it, Woody. They always pick the winners of the ones with babies in it. Well, I'm way ahead of you, Carla. We're all wearing diapers. Clifford, may I say that you look very handsome this evening, and may I speak with you alone a second? Uh, Come on, Rebecca. We all know you bought Robin Colcord a cheap tie for his birthday, so just hand it over to Clavin and let him be on his way. All right, Clifford, I have a very special problem, not like those other clowns. Robin is in Europe, and there's no way he'll get this tie in Paris on his birthday by Thursday unless it goes out tonight, express mail. Sarah, don't you worry your pretty little face. His package will be in the Rue de la Mont-Bajazon, uh -huh, as we speak. Good. Oops. Oops. What oops? What does that oops mean? Well, you forgot to return a dress here there, Miss Howe. Yeah, yeah. You'll never know if Robin got the tie or not. That, you know, it could end up in the dead letter office. Unlike that letter right over there. Huh? Our neatly typed official number 10 envelope, on which the return address is no problem. Oh, Doctor, you're absolutely right. The return address is no problem, but placement is, your shrinkness. See, we got some terrific new technology, and you can make it work for you by making your addressing readable. That is, readable to your good old optical scanner. Simply place the address in the middle of the envelope, and the return address in the upper left-hand corner. Well, it seems a bit picky. <laughs> well, Doctor Crane, listen up for a cosmic truth now, everybody. Listen up. Complete addressing and readable mail benefits the mailing public. The quicker we know where it's going, the quicker we get it there. I mean, like here. This is just a street name with no uh, ST or AVE or Boulevard abbreviation after it. I mean, those street designations are real, uh, you know, speeder uppers for the postal man. Woody, where is this going? What do you mean? The address is right there on it. That's right. The address is on it. Sure, I recognize it. It's a big office complex, but... You don't have the uh, suite number on it. Now, I know it because I go there all the time, but what if the regular carrier is sick or on vacation? How's his replacement supposed to know? Well, they're right there in the building. What's so hard about looking it up? <laughs> it's exactly the kind of thinking that slows us up on our appointed rounds. Well, Clavin, what could it take, a minute or two? Carla, every day the U.S. Postal Service moves 500 million pieces of mail. Now, supposing it takes the mailman, what, half a minute, even 10 seconds, to figure out what suite it's going to or what office it's supposed to be in. I mean, go ahead. What's, what's the math on that? Uh, 500 million times, uh, how long would that take? All right, all right, I get it, I get it. How about mine, Clippy? What are you saying, huh? Uh, feels about five years late. I know. Very funny. Come on, what about the address? How did I do? Well, you were careful to put North 43rd Street. Uh, that's very good. That's what we call your directionals, but, uh, Nummy, nummy, nummy. You forgot a zip code. <laughs> you got your zip code. Now, here's a regular zip code on your new improved Zip Plus 4 code. They're both designed to help people's mail get where it's supposed to go faster and more efficiently. So be sure and use them. And be sure they're clear and correct. <laughs> and if you're not sure, call your uh, local post office. Now, are there any questions? Woody. Why aren't there any white M&Ms? Oh, forget it. Oh, Cliff, we'll explain it to Woody later. You better get back on your route. You're going to miss getting Robin's birthday present there in time. Good point. Hey, and uh, I won't get my prize money. My son won't get educated in time. And I'll be doing time. <laughs> well, all right, well, folks, got to go. You know, the, the rain, the snow, the sleep. Hey, Clavin. Huh? Prove it. Go. <laughs> Clavin, the mail. <laughs> oh, I can't forget. <laughs> See you folks later. Have a good day.
one of the reasons I ran for mayor was I'm trying to develop a community uh, centered around woodworking. That's right. Centered around the, uh, uh, that carries over what I taught the students into their livelihood. And uh, we've got uh, several kill drying operations. Hardwood floors, and yeah, we're trying to develop an arts and crafts community in our town. That's great. If you'll, uh, <coughs> if you'll leave me your address and what have you, and uh, in my travels, if I'm ever into that area, I'll uh, I'll sure contact you. And okay. if you have any uh, if you have any activities that you need to speak for, I'd be delighted to oh, I'd love, be delighted to promote your woodwork. Operation. We'd love love to have you. Let me, let me uh, I should have pardon me have one of your cards. I'll put my address on the back. Of it. We travel quite a bit. machine like this, like so, and then have it done. Two passes would be completed. As, as uh, legend takes it along the way, when he was thinking about this idea, he had the nucleus of an idea of how to make this machine, he hadn't capped it often, 
couldn't figure out how to put it together, and was troublesome and worried him all the time, fell asleep in church one Sunday and dreamt about this particular machine. He woke up with a start, ran out of church saying, I've got it, I've got it. I'm sure the pastor said hallelujah, but what he didn't realize is it efficiently started the mechanization of the tin industry in this country. We here in America were the first in the world to start using machines like this in the tin industry. The English thought it was less quality to be using the machine. It was better to use everything and do everything by hand. So they, they didn't catch on until about 1834 of using machines like we did. Although they used a bar folder and they did a lot of stamping and swedging and hammering, they did not use the machines like this. They did, they did lift a lot of the, the tedious, time-consuming work. It was still a lot of manual labor that went into it. Manual dexterity was the key to doing it, how everything was going to be finished. It wasn't until about 1887 that we stopped importing tin from England. There was a protectionism measure completely for this country's tin industry. The tin prices were down so low that we could not compete with them here with our own tin. We discovered tin in the United States in the 70s, 1870s, in the Dakotas and Wyoming, and they couldn't make a living doing it because the, the tin from England was so cheap. It was a high-grade tin, and uh, they were selling it for pennies compared to what we did. So what the Congress did was McKinley Act in 1887 was to pass a law put the tariff on English tin, which killed the tin industry for, for it, no, English completely. Tinsmith was stopped being labeled as a tinsmith about 1932 when he went to the name of being a sheet metal worker. And they got completely out of doing tinware as we know it today. They were doing standing seam roofs using turned metal, which is a lead plate on tin. And it, that standing seam roof can last up to a hundred years if it's taken care of well. Because there was no nail holes through a standing seam. It was done with a clip that had a tack on itself underneath there. Hence, hence uh, expansion and heat contraction in the sun wouldn't lift and expand holes in the roof. And I've talked to some old time tinsmiths that said they've, they've taken apart standing seam roofs that have been on 150 years and just prepared little corners and spots here. As long as it was painted, it kept a good tight roof. Better than anything you can get today, that's for sure. <laughs> Sing. Now, a lot of folks listen to the bass singer, they just want to see how low he can sing. This guy, 
what a beautiful voice he has. If he can take a song like this next song, and this does a great job for the band of issues. And he's going to sing a song about God's voice. It's a silver spotted Acreopi. <laughs> We haven't been that bad right now.
clap and cheer. Hey! Sit down, lady. <laughs> yeah, lady, you better go to the bathroom and look for your britches. <laughs> Who wants to see it rain? Raise the hand. It is just a show. I'll ask another question. Who's having a good time so far today? Raise the hand. Say there, you're not having a good time. Raise your hand, lady. No, the, is she not beside you? Raise your hand. Good. I need a volunteer, lady, and I saw your hand up first. <laughs> What's your name? Joy. You're not nervous, are you? Good, don't be nervous. Sit down, lady. Joyce is going to sing for us. <laughs> Sit down, Joyce is going to sing. Sit down, Joyce is going to sing for us. What you going to sing, Joyce? <laughs> Why'd you volunteer, lady? Don't move, Joyce. I got something for you to do, and you don't have to sing. Joyce! Do you know what these are? <laughs> symbols. Now, this is a rain show. Guess what they symbolize? Anybody? Thunder. Rain. Thunder. Not rain. Who said thunder? Good answer. You're my next volunteer. Congratulations. <laughs> Joy, what I want you to do is strap these on your knees and start marching around the park up here a little bit. <laughs> Give me your foot, lady. <laughs> lady, you ain't saying. Give me your foot. Come on. I'm just kidding, lady. You don't have to put them on your knees. Grab the strings like that. Grab this string. No, it's not, but I'm afraid this is going to break. Watch your fingers. There, now. Grab the string. Like that. I think it's easy to do. Now, what I want you to do, Joyce... Oh, you're looking nervous. Come in. You're going to assimilate, okay? And in order to assimilate, put your feet about this far apart and bend your knees. That's it. Now, before you assimilate, you got to feel the energy from the ground. Are you ready, lady? Are you ready? Feel it! <laughs> lady, put these face down, bend your knees, get that constipated look on your face, and feel it! <laughs> Do you feel it? When you feel it, your knees are starting off and then start assimilating like crazy, Joey. Go, go, go! <laughs> Now, they want to work. You don't want to work. Come on, lady. That's it. Bang them together, lady. Come on. There you go. Come on. Keep going. No, lady. Come on. Lady, we're not going to get spit today, lady. Come on. I'll help you out this one time. Let them up. Ready? Go. Is that it? Don't move, lady. Come here. What's your name? Eric, are you very smart? Perfect, because you're going to be the dangling here so smart. What I want you to do is grab this rope, face the audience, and ring the bell. It's a rainmaker. Hold it. Is that it? Okay. Do it with a little finesse. Watch out a second. As you're ringing the bell, swivel your hips. Take a man in circular motion. <laughs> Ring that bell, okay? There you go. <laughs> go, come on. <laughs> Ring the bell. Come on, give us a little shake. Come on, for God's sake. Shut. Ring it and shake your hips a little bit. Put this arm out in front of you. 
That arm, maybe you should have been the ding a -ling lady. <laughs> Put this arm up in the air. Now look and listen, okay? Are you watching, lady? Here we go. Watch me. I want you to do this. Here we go. <laughs> And then you repeat it, okay, lady? No, come on. Go, lady, I'll help you out the first time. Okay, let's try. Can we try? What are you doing? Get over here. That's it, lady. She's taking the hit. Come on. Now, why are you going to be doing that? Go, rain. Do it again. Rain. Now, go out there. Now, come back. All three of you, let's see what you can do. Right. Go! Go! Shut your hips, but bang them together! Get out here! Go back! Stop! For God's sake, stop that noise! I need a gentleman volunteer, somebody who knows something about it. This uh, monster is basically just a treadle powered, foot powered, treadle operated uh, saw. Design is quite old on it. sort of rhythm with it, don't you, Mitch? Mm -hmm. You have to have a rhythm to... to you have to have a rhythm to operate it. Can we now, make sure uh, you it operates on cookie power? Yeah, uh, cookie power. Cookie yeah. power, okay. Two, two chocolate chip cookies per hour. It keeps it going very nicely. <laughs> okay. The basic departures from really, from two centuries on it are the V-belt and the pulleys. Uh, I went into the V-belt and the pulleys simply because I could get a perfect round and a constant relationship between the wheels by this route since I don't have a lathe to work with. A little bit of off balance or off center on the drive wheel or the flywheel, either one, really doesn't make that much difference as long as all the other things are constant. Um, What's the purpose? This is an idler wheel. This is an idler that uh, you simply use that to uh, uh, control the tension on your belt. Now this is a drive wheel here. This is a six inch diameter, one and a half inch thick oak uh, wheel that is pivoted or rides on a half inch bolt that is only threaded enough to go through the wood. It's perfectly smooth out in there. Um, this, uh, the drive wheel is loaded with six lead slugs. Uh, each one about three quarters of an inch in diameter and two and a quarter inches long. Uh, the holes are bored into the perimeter of the wheel and the molten lead poured in there. Then a band fed over the outside of that to keep them from flying out. Now the flywheel itself, the big one under here, has 32 lead slugs in that. Uh, the uh, 16 of them are an inch in diameter and two and a quarter inches long. That's bored into the perimeter of the wheel, cord flow, and then uh, a band bent on the outside of that, glued and nailed to hold those in place. And then the other 16 slugs, three quarters of an inch in diameter and two inches deep, bored in from the outside of the wheel uh, in between the uh, ones that run in the perimeter. So, uh, the mechanism is quite simple. This is made up of scraps, basically. Uh, the only uh, thing, now this big, big timber here is a piece of hickory, but any kind of dense timber would work for this. It is threaded. Where these bolts go through, it's threaded just like uh, it's metal, and the bolts are turned into that. Some of the nuts out here don't really hold anything. They just keep it, uh, keep it from shaking loose. That's okay, it. it looks pretty good, and you say it runs by cookie power. Uh, cookie power, uh, 
Looking for Pop? He's glad to get rid of Pop. Oh, He'll say thank you, Pop. It's bam. In the seventh grade, I'm a doing. I am doing an interview for the West Carter Photography Club. I'm interviewing my great grandmother, Tabitha Ann Litton. Her age is 80, 81 years old. She was born 1909. And let's begin. My great grandmother, Tabitha Litton. And okay, let's go. Uh, where was you born? Floyd County. Floyd County, Kentucky. Kentucky, Floyd County. Um, how was your house heated? It was coal. It's coal, it's coal stove. Coal stove and open fireplaces, cooked with wood, big wood range. Yeah. Uh, do you have a car? No. We walked. You walked? Did you, how did you get to school? Did you walk to school? Walked to school and back. Um, what was your father and mother's occupation? Farmers. Farmers? So they did not do anything outside the home? No, they worked at home. Okay. Um, and we had horses and hens to plow uh, and cows to give our milk and butter. What kind of foods did you eat? Canned or? Uh, we canned our own foods, sulfured our apples and dried our beans and hold up our potatoes. So mainly you just ate uh, what you grew? Our vegetables we grew and we had our own hogs for our meat. And you slaughtered hogs for bacon? That's right. Okay, um, what kind of toys did you play with? We made our own toys. Out of wood? Out of wood and anything we could hold up. Really? So there wasn't much you could do back then? There wasn't anything we could do. Really? We went to church, we walked to church and back. 
Sometimes our daddy would hook up the wagon, take a whole crowd of people to church and back. With a horse and a wagon? A horse and a wagon. So, um, what kind of, did you all travel anywhere? No, we didn't go. Well, we went to Inez, from Floyd County to Inez. Uh, how did you get there? A uh, horseback. Horseback? Horseback. Was that a long trip? Yes, it was. Um, uh, what do you think the differences are now? Well, it's a little too fast for me now. Really? <laughs> what do you think is better now than it was then? Well, you can get around better and you have ways going to the grocery store and, and the children going to school and everything is real handy. Well, what about, was there anything good, uh, was there anything better then than there is now? Well, it just wasn't so much dope and things like that going on and drinking and carrying on like they are now. Okay. Um, so, did you like it better when you was my age? Or well, now, care? not so well because it was really hard. Yeah. <laughs> so you had to work a lot? Had to work all the time in the fields and work at the homes and wash clothes on a washboard with an old tub. And Is that how you yeah. wash? How did you get your water? Uh, we carried it from a spring. Did you have a natural spring? A natural spring. We carried water from it. Was that a very far uh, Yes, it got a half a mile. And you had to carry had your water? Had to carry our water. And then getting to school, we had to go across in a boat, cross Johns Creek in a boat. In a boat? In a boat. They took us across. A paddle boat? Or a paddle boat. Every day? Every Even night when it was real cold? Yes. That would be tough. So, I guess that concludes our interview with the old timer. So, just thank you. Nearly half of Kentucky's land is covered with trees. These forest lands are growing in the heart of the Appalachian hardwoods region. This region is universally recognized for a lushness and quality that is unique in forest productivity. Kentucky's vast, lush timberlands offer scenic views, clean air, pure waters, countless birds, fish, and mammals that make Kentucky a vacation land for tourists and recreation enthusiasts. These same woodlands easily provide an abundant resource for forest industry whose products are recognized worldwide for their quality. Kentucky's forest lands not only support all these uses, they are actually increasing in both the area they cover and the extent of wood volume they are producing. There has been a steady increase in Kentucky's woodland acreage since the late 1940s. In the past 10 years alone, more than a half million acres of Kentucky's land was returned to woodlands. These extensive woodlands are increasing in total volume by more than 6% every year. Each year, the annual harvest of trees for wood products averages about 4.8% of total volume. This means that Kentucky's woodlands are growing more wood than is presently being harvested. 84% of the commercial forest land in Kentucky is owned by private individuals. Good forest stewardship is the key to producing all the benefits woodlands have to offer. Landowners who need assistance in evaluating and managing their forest environment should ask the advice of a professionally trained forester. Foresters with the state's Division of Forestry can perform many services through the division's tax-supported programs. Consultant foresters are also available for hire to perform these and other services on a larger scale. Professional foresters help landowners receive maximum economic return while improving wildlife habitat, recreation areas, water quality, and various other benefits a forest offers. One of the tools a professional forester might use to manage a woodland is timber harvesting. A harvest could be recommended for three primary reasons. The first reason is that the timber stand has reached maturity. A tree's life cycle is much the same as any other living thing. It grows rapidly in its youth, sustains a level of growth, matures, and then declines. When a tree's growth slows and the tree does not respond to improvement practices, harvesting is recommended. The second reason for a harvest is poor quality timber. 
Many stands in Kentucky contain trees of a much lower quality than they are capable of producing. Poor quality stands exist for various reasons. The most damaging and senseless reason is wildfire. Fire consumes. Along with killing small trees and saplings, wildfire does a great deal of damage to larger trees by damaging the bark. This allows insects and disease to enter the tree. Harvesting these poor quality trees gives young, healthy trees room to survive and grow. The third reason for recommending a harvest is to salvage timber before the land is disturbed. Examples are agriculture, mining, or industrial development. If the timber were not harvested, it would go to waste and the landowner would lose money. Salvage harvests are also done after natural disasters such as tornadoes or hurricanes. Trees are harvested so their economic value will not be lost. Regardless of the reason, a harvest is used to improve the woodland. It is used to ensure future production of high quality hardwood timber. The wood industries of Kentucky are major contributors to the success in harvesting trees to improve timber stands. The loggers, sawmills, and wood manufacturing plants use the harvested trees so nothing is wasted. When a log is processed at a sawmill, every part is used. Bark is made into mulch to put around plants. The slab or outer portion of the log is made into wood chips that are processed at a pulp mill into paper. Even the sawdust can be used to fuel boilers to dry lumber or make electricity. The grades and sizes of lumber cut from a log can be made into various products such as pallets, furniture, lumber for homes, and specialty products. Many specialty products are made from a certain kind of tree because of the characteristics of the wood. Whiskey barrels are made from white oak because it will not leak when the whiskey is poured into it. Tool handles are made from white ash because the wood is resistant to the shock of striking objects with the tool. Golf club heads are made from persimmon because of its hardness and beauty. Yellow poplar is easy to work and ideal for making molding. Fine furniture is made from walnut, cherry, and oak because of their distinctive and decorative grain patterns. Kentucky's hardwood forests produce a wealth of beauty and products for its people and for the world. Kentucky is the nation's fourth largest producer of hardwood lumber. More than 26,000 Kentuckians work in the 1,000 plus wood manufacturing plants located in 105 of Kentucky's 120 counties. The cooperative efforts of the Kentucky Forest Industries Association and the Kentucky Division of Forestry are helping to ensure the future and quality of Kentucky's hardwood forests. Managing the forests and the products derived from them will enable those who depend on the resource for their livelihood, as well as those who depend on the forest for recreation and beauty, to enjoy the benefits of Kentucky's forest for many years to come.